and welcome to another episode of the Literary Lutheran Reads a Book of Concord. We will pick up where we left off yesterday. Here again the adversaries will cry out that there is no need of good works if they do not merit eternal life. These lies we have refuted above. Of course, it is necessary to do good works. We say that eternal life has been promised to the justified. But those who walk according to the flesh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, retain neither faith nor righteousness. For this very reason we are justified. Being righteous, we may begin to do good works and to obey God's law. We are regenerated and receive the Holy Spirit for the very reason that the new life may produce new works, new dispositions, and the fear and love of God, hatred of lustful desires, concupiscence, and so on. This faith arises in repentance and should be established and grow amid good works, temptations, and dangers. This is so that we may continually be more firmly persuaded that God cares for us, forgives us, and hears us for Christ's sake. This is not, learned without, is not learned without many and great struggles. How often is conscience aroused? How often does it awaken even to despair when it shows either old or new sins or the impurity of our nature? This handwriting is not blotted out without a great struggle. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. Experience testifies what a difficult matter faith is. While we are encouraged in the midst of the terrors and receive comfort, other spiritual movements grow at the same time. Knowledge of God, fear of God, hope and love of God. We are renewed, as Paul says, in knowledge after the image of its creator. Colossians chapter 3 verse 10. And Beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. In other words, we receive the true knowledge of God so that we truly fear Him, which we truly trust that we are cared for by Him, and that we are heard by Him. This regeneration is the beginning of eternal life, as Paul says. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of life because of righteousness, Romans chapter 8, verse 10. And, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may, be, we may not be found naked, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. The honest reader can judge from these statements that we certainly require good works, since we teach that faith arises in repentance and is bound to increase in repentance. We place Christian and spiritual perfection in these matters if repentance and faith grow together in repentance. The godly can understand this better than the adversaries teaching about, con about contemplation or perfection. However, just as justification applies to faith, so also eternal life applies to faith. Peter says, Obtaining the outcome or fruit of your faith, the salvation of your souls, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. For the adversaries confess that the justified are children of God and co-heirs of Christ. Afterward, because works please God on account of faith, they earn other bodily and spiritual rewards. For there will be distinctions in the glory of the saints. Here the adversaries reply that eternal life is called a reward, and that therefore it is merited in a wholly deserving way, by good works. We reply briefly and plainly. Paul calls eternal life a gift, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, because by the righteousness presented for Christ's sake, we are made at the same time sons of God and co-heirs of Christ. As John says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, John chapter 3, verse 36. Augustine says, as also do very, also do very many others who follow him, God crowns his gifts in us. Elsewhere it is written, your reward is great in heaven, Luke chapter 6, verse 23. If these passages seem to conflict for the adversaries, they themselves may explain them. But the adversaries are not fair judges. They leave out the word gift. They also leave out the primary teachings of the entire matter. Further, they select the word reward and twist its meaning not only against scripture, but also against the common use of language. In this way, they conclude that because our works are called a reward, there should, be, there should be a price paid for eternal life. They assume that they are worthy of grace and life eternal and do not stand in need of mercy or of Christ as mediator or of faith. This logic is altogether new. 
We hear the term reward and are supposed to conclude that there is no need of Christ as mediator or of faith having access to God for Christ's sake, not for the sake of our works. Who does not see that these are unrelated sentences wrongly joined together? We do not argue about the term reward. We argue whether good works are of themselves worthy of grace and of eternal life, or whether they please only on account of faith, which takes hold of Christ as mediator. Our adversaries not only attribute this to works, namely that they are worthy of grace and of eternal life, but they also state falsely that works have surplus merits. The adversaries maintain that these merits can be granted to other people to justify them, as when monks sell to others the merits of their orders. They heap up these freakish ideas in the manner of Chrysippus, especially about this one word, reward. It is called a reward, therefore works are the price paid for it. So works please by themselves and not for the sake of Christ as mediator. And since one has more merits than another, some have surplus merits. Those who have earned them can sell them to others. Stop, reader. You don't have the whole chain of arguments. For certain sacraments of this purchase must be added. The hood is placed upon the dead. The blessings brought to us in Christ and the righteousness of faith have been hidden by such additions. We are not trying to start a needless word battle about the term reward, but this is a great, exalted, and very important matter about where Christian hearts can find true and certain comfort. It is about whether our works can give consciences rest and peace, whether we are to believe that our works are worthy of eternal life or whether that is given to us for Christ's sake. These are the real questions regarding these matters. If consciences are not rightly taught about these, they can have no certain comfort. However, we have stated clearly enough that good works do not fulfill the law, that we need God's mercy, that through faith we are accepted by God, that good works, be they ever so precious, even if they were the works of St. Paul himself, cannot bring rest to the conscience. It makes sense that we are able to believe that we receive eternal life through Christ by faith, not because of our works or of the law. But what do we say of the reward that Scripture mentions? If the adversaries will admit that we are regarded righteous through faith because of Christ, and that good works please God because of faith, we will not afterward argue much about the term reward. We confess that eternal life is a reward. It is something due because of the promise, not because of our merits. For the justification has been promised, which we have previously shown to be properly God's gift. To this gift, the promise of eternal life has been added, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 30. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Here belongs what Paul says, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. The justified are due the crown because of the promise. Saints should know this promise, not that they may labor for their own profit, for they ought to labor for God's glory. But saints should know it so they may not despair in troubles. They should know God's will. He desires to aid, to deliver, and to protect them. Although the perfect hear the mention of penalties and rewards in one way, the weak hear it in another way. The weak labor for the sake of their own advantage. Yet the preaching of rewards and punishments is necessary. God's wrath is set forth in the preaching of punishments. This applies to the preaching of, re of repentance. Grace is set forth in the preaching of rewards. Just as Scripture, in the mention of good works, often embraces faith, for it wishes righteousness of the heart to be included with the fruit. So sometimes it offers grace together with other rewards. We find this in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 8 through 14, and frequently in other places in the prophets. We also affirm what we have often said, that although justification and eternal life go along with faith, nevertheless good works merit other bodily and spiritual rewards and degrees of reward. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, each will receive his wages according to his labor. The righteousness of the gospel, which has to do with the promise of grace, freely receives justification in new life. But the fulfilling of the law, which follows faith, has to do with the law. In it, a reward is offered and is due not freely, but according to our works. Those who earn this are justified before they do the law. As Paul says, he has transferred 
us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, and we are fellow heirs with Christ. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 and Romans chapter 8 verse 17. But whenever merit is mentioned, the adversaries immediately transfer the matter from other rewards to justification. Yet the gospel freely offers justification because of Christ's merits and not of our own. His merits are delivered to us through faith. Works and troubles do not merit justification, but other payments as a reward is offered for the works in these passages. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Here, clearly, the measure of the reward is connected with the measure of the work. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Also here, the law offers a reward to a certain work. The fulfilling of the law earns a reward, for a reward properly relates to the law. Yet we should be mindful of the gospel, which freely offers justification for Christ's sake. We neither obey the law nor can obey it, before we have been reconciled to God, justified and reborn. Nor would fulfilling the law please God unless we were accepted because of faith. People are accepted because of faith. For this very reason, the initial fulfilling of the law pleases and has a reward in this life and in the next. Regarding the term reward, many other remarks derived from the nature of the law might be made here. Since they are too long, they must be explained in another connection. This has been the Literary Lutheran Reads the Book of Concord, and I wish you a blessed day.